Hello. There we go. Uh, if everyone could find a seat, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Good morning. My name is Craig Rule, and I'd like to welcome you all to our meeting. I'll be representing this meeting on behalf of Commissioner Dominguez, who sends her regards. I'd like to start by asking the principal board members to introduce themselves and who they're representing. Uh, please state who you're representing and start from my far left. Hi, I'm David Barron, the Deputy Executive Director of the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority, representing our Executive Director, Mary Amin. Uh, good morning, I'm Jeremy Colangelo, the Chief Planner at New Jersey Transit, representing President Kevin Corbett. Good morning, Matt Larita from uh, EPA, representing our Regional Administrator, Pete Lopez. Good morning, Steve Goodman. I'm the Regional Administrator for the FTA here in New York, representing the FTA in New York. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick Marquis. I'm the uh, Federal Highway Division Administrator here in New York, and I am representing myself. Hi, Duncan Kessier, uh, Port Authority uh, Assistant Director for Planning and Regional Development, representing Executive Director Rick Cotton. Hi, good morning. I'm Larry Lennon, I'm Director of MTA Planning. I'm here representing Pat Foy, our Chairman. I'm Laura Smith with the New York City Department of City Planning, representing our Director, Marisa Lago. Uh, Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner, New York City Department of Transportation. Ed Day, Rockland County Executive. Sandra Fusco, Planning Commissioner, representing Mary Ellen O'Dell, County Executive for Putnam County. Naomi Klein, Director of Transportation Planning, Westchester County, representing County Executive George Latimer. Hello, everyone. I'm County Executive from Nassau, Laura Curran, representing the 1.4 residents of Nassau. Good morning. Uh, my name is Darnell Tyson. I'm the Acting Commissioner of the Suffolk County DPW, representing County Executive Steve Ballone. Good morning. I'm Michael Sheehan with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, representing Commissioner Sagos. Okay, as per NIMTIC's operating procedures, a quorum of the members present for the February 27th, 2020 council meeting. Good morning. On behalf of Commissioner Dominguez, I would first like to thank New York City DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg for her leadership and vision in serving as co-chair of NIMTIC this past year. Please join me in welcoming Rockland County Executive Ed Day in his incoming role as the rotating co-chair. County Executive Day has a long career in a dedicated public service and community involvement. It's a privilege to have County Executive Day serve as the NIMTEC co-chair. I would like to personally extend my appreciation to the members and staff of NIMTEC for an outstanding and noteworthy year. Your partnership and engagement in the planning process is critical to our continued efforts towards renewal and modernization of the region's transportation infrastructure. I also want to thank Governor Cuomo for his bold leadership in recognizing that New York's economic security is closely linked to making the nation's leading investments in the state's roads, bridges, transit systems, airports, and seaports. The governor knows that transportation investments are key to the New York metropolitan area's economic competitiveness. New York is not only investing more today in transportation infrastructure than ever, but the state is building back better, providing cleaner, climate-friendly alternatives, alleviating congestion and rebuilding in a more resilient and efficient way. This NIMTIC region continues to make historic investments in infrastructure to support and facilitate community growth, economic competitiveness, and resilience, including the Van Wyck capacity and access improvements to JFK in the New York City region, the construction of the third track on the Long Island Railroad main line to add redundancy and reduce delays in the Long Island region, and bridge replacements at multiple locations to mitigate flood risk like East Lincoln Avenue over the Hutchinson River Parkway in the Mid-Hudson region. These projects help the region to grow and remain economically competitive. The members of the council are creating opportunities to move the region forward, and I thank you for your continued support. And now I turn it over to Commissioner Trottenberg for her remarks. Thanks, Greg. 
Good morning, everyone. As I said, I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of New York City Department of Transportation and now outgoing uh, co-chair of NIMTIC. And I, too, want to thank my partner, Greg Rule, and to congratulate um, County Executive Day for coming in. Uh, the main reason we're actually here for this meeting today is to approve our 2021 Unified Planning Work Program. It's work that the staff and all the member agencies work together on very closely, and I want to thank the staff. I think we're having done a terrific job. But I really want to talk about today's guest speaker, um, who's going to be talking about the theme of this meeting, Funding for the Future. Uh, a lot of you may know Stephen Gardner, who is here from Amtrak. I'm going to try and remember Stephen's title. I'll get it right. He is exec Senior Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, and Commercial Officer. But I know Stephen as someone I've had the privilege of working with for over two decades now in various roles on Capitol Hill and in the Obama administration. And he has shown some pretty extraordinary leadership steering Amtrak through a period really of growth and renewal and, and really some forward-looking projects. So we are super lucky to have him here today. So I want to call him up on the stage and give him a hug. Come on up, Stephen Gardner. Well, thank you, Polly, and uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and see all of you. Um, it was a very generous introduction, and, and I want to uh, particularly uh, express my appreciation for all that you do. I um, come from a family in local government. My father was a county manager of a little place called Arlington County in Virginia, and as, a, as he liked to say, I had a good boy from Astoria growing up here, uh, and I saw firsthand what a difference local leadership makes in um, creating uh, vibrant uh, and prosperous communities. So thank you all for your contributions. In particular, I'd like to thank um, recognize the incoming co-chair, uh, Mr. Day, who's our Rockland County uh, uh, Commissioner there, and also Laura Curran for uh, your, your work. Um, let me also just acknowledge our federal partners, Steve, uh, for uh, representing the FTA here in uh, the region and who is a critical uh, partner for us and our commuter partners here. So thanks for all you do. And uh, Mr. Marquise uh, for FHWA's cooperation as well. We interface with FHWA in a variety of ways across our network and really appreciate all the cooperation we get. So um, thank you again. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, I. First, begin by bringing some well wishes from our chairman, Tony Kosha. I'm the plan B. Unfortunately, Tony couldn't be here today. Um, and many of you in the room probably have know of him. Some of you have had a chance to work with him. He's a huge asset for Amtrak uh, and a driving force of much of the positive change of the company that I'm going to talk about today. It's not an overstatement to say that we would be in a very different place without his leadership. There's really, I think, no chance we'd be where we are in the Gateway Program. Uh, and so many other initiatives that are important to this region. And we're very fortunate to have him at the helm of our ship. Um, let me talk a little bit about the positive change that is underway at Amtrak. After nearly 50 years of existence, we turn 50 next year, um, passenger rail and Amtrak both are experiencing somewhat of a renaissance. I'm proud to say that in FY19, the fiscal year we just ended last year, we had the best year in the company's history by, by quite uh, a, a long measure across our whole 46 state, 21,000 mile network. We had zero employee and customer fatalities. We continued our long record now of setting new records in ridership and revenue with a new ridership record of 32 and a half million passengers. We invested over $1.6 billion in capital, uh, in capital in our assets, including things really important to this region on the infrastructure and in refreshed equipment, uh, notably our Acelas and our uh, regional Amfleet cars. Um, we achieved $3.3 billion in operating revenue. That's a 3.5% growth over the prior year and set an operating loss record uh, that uh, really is kind of astounding for the company. We had an operating loss a little bit less than $30 million. Just to put it in context, when Polly and I sort of first had a chance to meet in early 2000, and uh, I looked up to Polly in awe and her uh, leadership in the, in the Congress then, and I was just a young intern, um, Amtrak had an operating loss of $1 billion. So we're now at 30 million last year, 29, and this year we will be 
uh, either at break even on the operating side or better. Um, and uh, in addition to achieving ridership growth and financial improvement, we grew service. We grew service in a number of markets around the country and we introduced new things here in the Northeast Quarter like our nonstop service for a seller between New York and Washington, which I hope some of you have had a chance to experience. Uh, and all of that has helped us build more and more support from Congress. We achieved really our best year ever in federal appropriations for this year, for <laughs> FY20, and it's building off a record of several years in which Congress on a bipartisan basis has been investing more and more into Amtrak as we have proven our ability to improve the operation and take those dollars and invest them in meaningful uh, changes in the network. A big part of um, that success, of course, is the Northeast Corridor. I'm happy to say that in 2020 so far, we continue the trends of 19. December was our best revenue and ridership month ever. Our first quarter was the best quarter in the history of Amtrak. We grew ridership in December 10% compared to last December, and we grew revenue by 12%. The Northeast Corridor really is the driver of this phenomena, but it is not isolated to the Northeast Corridor. It, in fact, is a national phenomena. But let's talk about the Northeast Corridor. I think everyone here knows how important the region is to the nation and the corridor is to the region. You've got 2% of the landmass here in the Northeast, 17% of the nation's population, 20% of the GDP, a $2.6 trillion economy. So an incredible economic engine for the entire nation and, in fact, the world. The NEC is really the, one of the core transportation assets of this region. We've got 2,200 daily trains right up and down the corridor. That's trains operated by Amtrak, eight commuter railroads, four freight railroads every day across four contiguous but separately owned pieces of infrastructure linking Washington to Boston and to uh, with some branches to uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's the busiest railway in North America by far. Uh, there's, there's nothing else even close. Uh, produces about 80,000 trips a day and more than 250 million trips a year. Just to put that in context, that's the equivalent of one-third of all domestic employments in the United States. So this one railroad is producing every day the same as one third of all of our entire air system for the U.S. in terms of the passenger trips. For Amtrak, the importance of the quarter is quite clear. Uh, first off, we see it really as a proof point for the potential for inner city and rail generally across the nation. Now, surely the region is special. I gave you some of the superlatives to begin with. You're well aware of them. It's got incredible density of institutions, government, industry, and population. But as you all know, the region is mature. And in fact, the mantle of growth nationwide has been shifting. It's been shifting to the south, to the west, to the southwest. And the major metros and corridors in those regions are starting to look a lot more like the Northeast Corridor in terms of population density, congestion, and economic development. And the same pressures that are in work here, <clears throat> congestion, urbanization, the degradation of performance across the other modes of transport, and the crisis that's occurring within our climate, those same pressures that push people to rail here are pushing rail as an option in other parts of the nation. So when we talk to Atlanta or Phoenix or a place like Texas where Dallas and Houston, I have 13 million people between the two of them. That's more than the 38th to 50th states populations combined, just in those two cities alone. We talk to them about the opportunities that rail can play and the value it can bring. What we do is we point to the success of the Northeast Corridor to show what can happen with a uh, prolonged series of investments and uh, level of service, frequency, and reliability that makes rail an integral part of an economy. And the success of the Northeast Corridor, when we point to it, is pretty stark. Over the last 10 years, we've grown ridership on the NEC more than 25%, adding almost 3 million additional riders to our service. Today, while the NEC services account for only about a third of our overall ridership, it produces half of our revenues. 
the NEC, uh, within the NEC services, that pattern is replicated again with the CELA providing just one third of the Northeast Corridor Amtrak ridership, but producing half of the total revenue. To put this in perspective, just to use 2000 as a, as a baseline again, um, prior to the launch of a sell up, the Northeast Quarter had a net operating deficit, about 20, 30 million bucks at the time. Today, it provides roughly $500 million in net operating surplus that goes straight back into the railroad as capital investment. Similarly, the growth of commuter rail operated by all our partners across the NEC has been outstanding, showing the potency of a mixed traffic railway that can accommodate both various trip lengths and various trip types on one common infrastructure. And while you may hear occasional uh, tussles that pop up between us and our commuter partners, in general, we have a great relationship and we take our role as steward of this infrastructure very seriously. And we see mutual growth and improvement as a key part of our mission and responsibility. Before we break out the champagne, however, and start patting ourselves on the back about how great the Northeast Corridor is and you know, the in inevitable sort of rise of passenger rail in 21st century, let me just make it clear how fragile this success is and just how precarious the current situation remains. Just to give you sort of an anecdote here, let's just take a kind of typical situation. Let's pretend it's a hot, summer afternoon about 4 30 in the height of rush hour penn station you know it's the nation's busiest transportation facility it's got the equivalent if you have the subways in the equivalent of the entire population of milwaukee in it every day right so you know dwarfing any other transportation facility in the, in the united states um and uh, it's very busy crowds crowds are, are moving and forming and suddenly there's a power failure in our north river tunnel this is the tunnel underneath the hudson river it's 109 years old it's one track in, one track out, 24 trains on each of those tracks in each of those directions every day in the peak. And it connects New Jersey and New York. It's really the sole rail pathway uh, for inner city service and much commuter service uh, to the south. So when we have something like that, our engineer, engineering forces, our operating folks scramble to try and figure out the problem. Right away, you're gonna have something like six trains stopped in the tunnels we have a problem like that so six trains simultaneously about three in each direction each of those trains depending on who, whether it's a transit train or amtrak train you're somewhere between 400 500 to 1200 people per train in addition you've got dozens of trains stacked up on either side so caucus or at penn waiting to get out trains that are waiting to get out of penn also means they're backed up in the east river tunnel which means they're backed up in herald all the way through um, social media is going to light up immediately. You're going to see lots of commuter, commuters and customers trying to figure out their plan B for the day. That usually means path, bus terminal, subways, ferries, whatever means necessary to try and come up with an alternative way to get home. Back underground, our forces are working to try and figure out the problem. Um, let me just say that the infrastructure there is not the kind of infrastructure that pings your phone when you have a problem, right? It's, it's, uh, this is state of the art 1930s technology generally, and it requires a lot of time and attention to figure out what's going on. In the meantime, everything else continues to back up. And for the remainder of the night, let's just say that outage is concentrated on one tunnel. We have at least one little thread that connects the entire Northeast network in the form of, of the one single track North River tube operation. <coughs> Of course, tens of thousands of people are interrupted in this single event. Uh, that means missed bedtime with kids, missed dinners, missed dates, missed opportunities um, for a job interview, all of those things that are impacted when this system doesn't work the way it should. And unfortunately, this scenario, which I've given, is not hypothetical. We deal with this, something like this every day, every week, you know, every month across the corridor in some respect. Here in New York, the nation's busiest terminal, uh, which relies on that old infrastructure, or in the BNP tunnel in Baltimore, this was a 1873 asset that's built in the Grant administration, Ulysses S. Grant administration, this tunnel was built. Um, or, you know, at any of the hundred year old movable bridges we have, we've got a bunch up and down the railroad. Um, they all represent 
single points of failure that can cripple or halt the utility of this network. So in one of our sort of grand ironies, the more successful the Northeast Quarter has gotten, the more we have worked together with our partners to make it better, uh, the more vulnerable in a way it has become. It relies on um, this, uh, in, in a way, a kind of amazing collection of Victorian to modern area technology uh, for its operation. And more and more trains are putting more and more pressure on that system. And more and more people are relying on those trains every day. Remarkably, even with such challenges, the overall system performance is pretty good right now. Uh, with commuter operations op with operating at about 90%, uh, mid or low 90% OTP over our portion of the network, and Amtrak's OTP on time performance about 87% year to date so far for our services. But the threats to that are very real, and it takes minor problems to throw that performance into a tailspin. And addressing this is what I'd like to focus on for the rest of my talk here. Amtrak has a clear understanding of the role we play in the region and in the infrastructure equation that makes this area so vibrant. We see our job as helping to move the region forward by increasing inner city passenger rail service <laughs> and by providing the reliable infrastructure and capacity needed to grow commuter and freight service for the years and decades ahead. But more than ever before, such a task requires a partnership between us and you, the leaders of our region, uh, and our shared reliance on this asset has grown, and our shared responsibility has grown with it. Gone are the old days when the federal government, in theory, would have supplied all of the capital needed to modernize and improve the NAC for the benefit of all users. As close observers of our history will know, uh, that theory was never practiced, um, sometimes in a uh, sort of dramatic fashion. And that's led us to where we are today, which is a $40 billion backlog of capital renewal across the network. Instead, we now have a shared model of funding, one in which Amtrak must bring its revenues and its federal appropriations and various grants that it's eligible for together to fund the inner city share of this asset. And we have to work with our commuter partners and other users to fund their respective share through their own sources and through those available through the FTA. This new model requires significantly expanded levels of cooperation, collaboration, planning, engagement, and mutual funding not only between the railroads themselves, but between us railroads and MPOs like yourselves and planning organizations, state governments, and the private sector who's increasingly playing a bigger role in helping to both build and manage infrastructure that supports development. I'm happy to report that across the region, this new era of partnership is starting to take root and bear fruit. In both states, we have leaders that understand that 21st century infrastructure is required in order to build the 21st century economy. Thanks in large part to Governor Murphy's leadership and the commitment of $600 million in local bonding for, port, uh, for the Portal North Bridge project to fund their share of the program and enable uh, hopefully eventually an FTA CIG, F, uh, CIG grant, we're a big step closer to building a new bridge over the Hackensack Hackensack River to replace the infamous Portal Bridge, which many of you have undoubtedly heard about when it fails to close and causes massive disruption on the corridor. We're very grateful to the governor and to NJT's executive director, Kevin uh, Corbett, and to Jeremy and his colleagues who have worked really hard to bring this project uh, together with Amtrak to fruition. And once built, this new bridge will improve reliability for the over 200,000 Amtrak and NJT trips, which cross this bridge daily. On this side of the river, later this year, thanks to the strong leadership of Governor Cuomo and the Empire State Development Corp, Amtrak will expand its New York terminal operations across 8th Avenue through the opening of the new Moynihan train hall. Moynihan will help redefine Amtrak's experience in New York and represents the dawn of really a new era for us as it's our first major new terminal in our entire history. 
Moynihan will also benefit Long Island Railroad passengers who will be using that space, and indirectly and through extension, NJT customers who will now have expanded use of Amtrak's current level B space in existing Penn. It's a great example of the kind of partnership and collaboration that can make the Northeast Corridor better. In the case of the tunnels here in New York, both the East and North River tunnels, we're taking steps to advance with our partners the vital rehabilitation of these century-old assets. We've heard a lot about the Northeast River or North uh, River Tunnel, the Hudson Tunnel. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the ERT, as we call it, the East River Tunnel. These tunnels connect Manhattan to Queens. There are four of them, makes them quite different than the two, the two tubes underneath the Hudson. And they were built along with the North River Tunnels and Penn Station. Um, and essentially follow the same design. Uh, a little known fact is that these river tunnels were much more significantly impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, two of those four tunnels were um, inundated with flood water. In fact, seven million gallons of seawater entered those tunnels and filled all the way up to the crest of the tunnel uh, in, in, in the low part of the tunnel uh, under the river. And that seawater has severely damaged the track, the concrete, the electrical systems uh, that are in the tunnel and present a long-term reliability challenge uh, for continued operations. We have been working um, sort of in a way, not behind the scenes, but with less focus uh, from the media on this project, just as we've been advancing work on the North River tubes. We're now approaching 60% design on our uh, East River Tunnel Tunnel Rehab Program. And as we advance design and get more specific about the means and methods, we're working closely with our partners at, at uh, MTA and the NJT to ensure we can get this project done quickly, safely, and with as little as disruption, little disruption as possible. Just to be clear, what's gonna have to happen here is we're gonna have to shut down for some period of time, one of the four tubes underneath the river to do full rehab. We're working hard to figure out how to minimize that impact and get as much done as we can outside of a closure. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done and it's imminent, it's uh, vital. And um, it represents really the first of many series of big renewal projects that needs to still come, need to still come here in the terminal zone. Beyond that project, we're working with MTA to start commuter service on the Hellgate line, uh, serving the Bronx and um, providing a new connection to uh, residents from Connecticut to the region. And uh, of course, we're also working with Long Island Railroad to begin hopefully Amtrak service to Long Island, direct service from the corridor, eventually connecting Long Island population centers to points uh, north and south, and potentially also uh, up the Empire Line to Albany. Uh, to expand uh, options for uh, our communities there. In addition, we work with MTA and New Jersey Transit on Penn Station in ways big and small. We're focused right now on improvement to the existing uh, level B area with New Jersey Transit, a new waiting area, refreshed um, uh, part of the uh, concourse. And we're underway with the MTA and ESD uh, and NJT looking at the future of Penn as we approach Moynihan and think about expansion in the future. And then of course there's Gateway. Um, through really the remarkable work of a lot of people on both sides of the river, what was pretty audacious plan to rebuild the entrance to New York from the south and double long-term train capacity by expanding the main line into New York and expanding Penn Station to the south, now is moving closer and closer to reality. Made possible not only by the nuts and bolts work of the planners and engineers at Amtrak and NJT and others, uh, but also by the bi-state creation of the new Gateway Development Corp and, uh, and commission and the state commitments that have come with that to share equally in half of the total project costs. There's truly no other pro program nationwide of the size and complexity that this region is uh, undertaking with us. And together, the states are pushing past historic barriers to rise to the challenge. To make all this work, Amtrak knows that it has to become a stronger partner and stronger entity across really three fronts. First, we've got to continue to modernize our products and services so we can support growth working hard to position ourselves to seize on these opportunities of a rail renaissance, 
reimagining our route structure, investing in PTC technology, upgrading our mobile app and Wi-Fi offerings, implementing seat assignments, refreshing uh, our stations. <clears throat> We're also undertaking the largest fleet recapitalization in our 50-year history, including 28 new Acela train sets that are under construction right now in Hornell in New York State. And uh, we are in the middle of procurement on an entirely new fleet of trains to replace the Amtrak regional service uh, equipment here on the Northeast Corridor and its use elsewhere. And that effect of all these efforts is we're growing our business and improving our financial performance so that we can plow more and more of the cash that we earn into solving the longstanding capital pro problems uh, across the network. And we've made real success. Today, just to put it in perspective, only about 40% of the planned expenditures in 2020, 2021 will come from public sources. About $7 billion we plan to invest, only 40% of that comes from states, commuter railroads, the federal government. <clears throat> Majority of the funding that we're bringing to bear is funding that we're generating through our ticket sales and through our other means to, to grow revenue. Second, we have to build an organization that can accomplish big things after decades of really just trying to keep the lights on. To this end, we've been rebuilding our engineering department. We're investing in $350 million worth of new production capacity so that we can double the ability to rebuild our railroad. We've got new asset management systems underway. We're strengthening our project management capabilities. We're using new technology to speed up our work, minimize the impact on train uh, operations and improve safety for both our employees and our customers. Perhaps nowhere has this effort uh, been better exemplified by our Penn Renewal Program, which we started in 2017 to address long-standing state of good repair issues in Penn Station. Working together with our partners at New Jersey Transit and Long Island Railroad, and we've been able to deliver complex uh, renewal projects in a coordinated way on time and on budget focusing on minimizing impacts to customers, but getting the needing investments done. Finally, we need to be a better partner with the capacity and attitude to find solutions and get things done through collaboration. This means not only with our public sector partners, who really are the core of the, of the responsible parties with us, but also through our private sector partners. And just this uh, week, we've been talking about uh, some work we're doing with related companies to build the third section of the concrete casings at Hudson Yards. This is the sort of receptacle that ultimately will be able to meet the tunnel, the new tunnel we're trying to build under the river. Uh, and collaboration with uh, folks like them and others is key to being able to help us accomplish our goals and bring in new partners and opportunities for investment. The key to all these efforts, and this is really the topic of your session today, is funding. And without sustained investment, all the gains we're making today can be easily lost. The region's elected leaders know that we must create new ways to fund projects across the region. <coughs> and in a material way, that's happening in the Northeast Corridor. I think everyone here deserves some credit uh, for making New York State the first state in the nation to blunt congestion pricing. I know that won't be easy and there's a lot of work to be done still, but it is vital that we figure out new ways to bring resources to the task at hand, which is fundamentally rebuilding the infrastructure we all inherited from our forefathers uh, and at the same time expanding it for the capacity necessary for growth. So I want to recognize the work that's been done here in this region already. I think it is a game changer and everyone should be proud of taking the leadership that was necessary here. And we hope that is followed up and down the corridor in similar ways. We've been working hard on our piece of this equation with help from and support from our state and commuter partners. We've been fortunate to secure the highest levels of congressional support, as I mentioned earlier, uh, since we were created in 1971. Especially as it relates to our infrastructure goals, Congress has really signaled very clearly that it supports investment. And it's been giving more and more investment to Amtrak through our Northeast Corridor account and through the grant programs that can help us accomplish programs like Portal Bridge. But just to put this in perspective, only about a third of all the funds we receive from our annual appropriation are for the Northeast Corridor. And, I, and we estimate our annual need is about three to four times the size of our current funding levels if we were to advance 
the core recapitalization projects that we have underway over the next 20 years. And just to give you an international comparator, <clears throat> good to put this in context sometimes, but Germany just recently embraced Deutsche Bahn, which is the national operator of the service there, and the infrastructure owner. Uh, their plan to increase capacity to meet the country's climate objectives over the next 20 years. And this program is called Strong Rail. And uh, government and DB have jointly partnered in that, and that's going to deliver $86 billion in additional investment over the next 10 years, on top of the base of investment for, for, for the railway, to strengthen passenger rail. So that's basically double the entire amount of federal funding Amtrak's received in 49 years. And it's for a nation the size of New Mexico, which has a population 25% our size. So the, the uh, level of investment required to take the system to the level where it could be making material changes in mode share, material contributions to climate, are pretty, pretty, pretty enormous compared to where we are today. And to get there, to really affect meaningful change and accomplish this kind of shift, we really have to fundamentally address the way that we allocate funding to infrastructure projects overall. And the upcoming reauthorization of the federal programs is the best opportunity that we have to do that. We're working right now on our reauthorization proposal. We've started to talk about some elements of it. We'll be announcing our full proposal later this spring. But at the core of this is expanding reliable, dedicated funding for intercity passenger rail as part of many modes that have to contribute to mobility in the nation, both here in the Northeast Corridor and across our national network. In particular, it's trying to figure out a way that we can sustain long-term reliable funding for those big mega projects that today dwarf the sort of O&M type expenditures we've been doing for the last 40 years and just don't fit in the current programs. Existing, fo existing federal programs don't have the resources necessary for these over the long term, and they're not built to handle projects which have durations of 5, 10, 15 years. We think any new federal program and re renewal of existing federal programs need to create space for these types of mega projects, which are focused not on mode, but on outcomes, on what they can do for economy, safety, mobility, development, and that the type of projects that we have here in the region and across the Northeast Corridor are perfect examples of the opportunities that lie ahead with the right level of federal partnership and the right strength and planning and contribution from <coughs> local and regional entities. So, as Congress looks to surface transportation reauthorization, we owe them a gratitude for a, a debt of gratitude for what they've accomplished so far, but the work ahead is much more important. We need them to come together effectively to argue for investments in this corridor and to prioritize them up front as part of the overall program of surface reauthorization. And in order to do this, we need the kind of partnerships we have at the local level with our commuter partners and with regions and with state and local governments. Historically, the Northeast Corridor has been sort of somebody else's problem. The focus at state and local levels primarily has been on the FHWA and FTA programs, rightfully so. They've been incredibly important to both enhancing and preserving the, the mobility we have. But in the future, rail has got to be a critical part of this mix. We need to figure out how to both provide the funding for the renewal and capacity in our existing major transportation modes, but also incorporate funding for the Northeast Corridor. Frankly, that's only going to happen if the region stands up and demands it, and if they're supported by the localities and region, regional uh, entities like yourselves in making this request. So looking to the future, I'm daunted, but overall I'm really inspired by what we have before us. Inspired by the success we've achieved to date, 
I'm inspired by the shift in cultural and demographic trends that are aligning with Amtrak's and passenger rail's sort of natural capabilities with urbanization, rises in, in density, and frankly, a shift towards a focus on convenience and productivity during transport. The alignment with passenger rail's never been better. It's an important time in our history, and for decades we've lived off those generational improvements made by our grandparents and great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents in some cases. But now it's time for all of us to do our part, manage the next generation of capacity. We've got to not only preserve what we've got, but create the assets that are going to last for 30, 50, 100, 200 years and bring the region forward. In the Chinese language, the word crisis is denoted with two symbols. One is for danger and one is for opportunity. And the word crisis itself actually comes from the Greek for sift or to separate. The crisis itself can absolutely separate us. And look, it's a time where a lot of things are in flux. And many things feel in a way as if they're falling apart. Danger's definitely in the air. But crises are also opportunities. They have a chance to bring us together and to unite us in the desired outcome. We have that moment today with our infrastructure in the Northeast Corridor, and I'm confident that together we can achieve things for the collective good. We're ready and focused on being that partner with all of you, and we look forward to your participation and hopefully equal partnership in trying to make this region more successful, a better place to live, improving our environment and building our quality of life here together. So thanks very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. Be happy to take any questions if there are some. Thank you. Are there any questions from the members? Thanks, Stephen, for that great speech. Uh, I have to remember one of the first time when you first started working at Amtrak, you used to have a line that stuck in my head is you would say, um, I'm trying to deliver my cap because so much of your capital funding came from Congress. You would say we're halfway through my fiscal year and I'm trying to deliver a capital plan and I don't know how much funding I'm getting for my capital plan. And I think you guys have come such a long way since then. It's really impressive. Can you, can you tell us, obviously in this region, we are really interested in Gateway and maybe you can talk in a little more detail about the state of play, what's happening with the Gateway Corporation, kind of what your your prognosis is. Sure, yeah. Um, well, look, you know, we, um, we, I think, got some great news on trying to advance different elements of this program, right? It's a complicated program, just to sort of summarize, we've got two basic phases, right? We have a first phase, which is really focused on trying to uh, ensure that the current capacity and performance we have is maintained. And that involves replacing and renewing a number of assets that, that our daily service relies upon. And Portal Bridge is a perfect example of that, right? We've got this 109-year-old swing bridge. It, quite cranky. It frequently doesn't like to close. Sometimes it catches on fire. Um, you know, and, and in, in the meantime, the, the, you know, the whole balance of this network relies on its performance every day. Uh, we think it's, you know, long ago earned its retirement and are anxious uh, to get that uh, replaced. Um, phase two is to take this stabilized asset and expand it. Because what the heart of the program is um, this curiosity of history, which is that the railroad from Newark to the south, this four track, sometimes actually six track railroad with a lot of capacity, a lot of service. And then at Newark, we shrink down in capacity for to three tracks and then ultimately two tracks into two tubes into, the, into Penn Station. And um, that creates an incredible bottleneck where we have to funnel in all these trains to this very limited uh, amount of capacity, and it creates the highest density railroad operation in North America. So there's nowhere else that anyone tries to run 24 <laughs> trains an hour in each direction on two tracks, particularly not two tracks that rely on 100-year-old stuff. Um, so we're um, 
really focused on advancing both parts of this program, though obviously uh, phase one is the place that um, presents the most urgency. And I talked a little bit about where we are with, with Portal Bridge, which is um, a, we've just recently achieved a higher rating through the FTA process, which hopefully will lead us to uh, be getting a, a ultimately a, a process of funding uh, together, NJT, uh, through NJT's leadership uh, um, with the Federal Transit Administration to get a project underway there. We've done some preparatory work on that and we are hopeful that we can uh, make it through the remainder of the funding process. Amtrak itself is prepared. We've got the funding we need to be able to take our part of that uh, leap and move forward on that project. Uh, while that's underway, we continue to uh, work in advance on the Hudson Tunnel program, right? This is our program to build a new tunnel under the river and to rehab the North River Tunnel. Um, key to that is uh, continuation of the design work, completion ultimately of the environmental work, which is with the department at the, at the moment, and over time acquisition of property, a whole series of things that have to happen to take this program and bring it to uh, conclusion. We continue to work every day on advancing the program through the technical means and uh, continue uh, to build um, a stronger and stronger reservoir of capacity to undertake the project. And we're doing that together with uh, both uh, our partners at NJT, but also the Port Authority and the new um, commission, which is established, but still awaiting all of its members uh, will stand up uh, to help bring both uh, guidance and participation to this program, uh, the Hudson Tunnel program itself, but also the larger suite of projects overall. So we remain um, very uh, focused on how to ensure we do not lose time as we go through all the approval processes on this project. The North River Tunnel is a key asset that must be maintained reliably. We continue, we're, we were looking currently at ways to advance some of the reliability improvements we need in the interim while we wait for the full tunnel uh, construction. That tunnel construction is essential in order for us to take the existing tubes out of service and do all the rehab work that needs to be done. Um, but in the meantime, we've got to keep a reliable asset for the benefit of Amtrak passengers and New Jersey Transit's passengers who rely on it every day. And um, we've also started working um, with both the state here in, in New York and Amtrak and NJT on the Penn Station and expansion projects, looking at how we build the capacity. To put that in context, you know, we've got 21 tracks. During the peak period, there's, there's no room at the end. You know, there's no available space on those tracks or platforms to handle really uh, any material train growth. Right now, we're basically frozen solid. If we wanted to add more trains, if we magically could create additional tracks and capacity into Penn Station, we would not be able to use them because uh, in, 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 in terms of adding service because the tracks and platforms at Penn Station uh, cannot accommodate more trains. So essential to the long-term vision of Gateway is being able to expand out um, Penn Station. So we are working across all of these areas where we, uh, we'll, we'll continue to do that. We've got uh, lots invested in the project. And at the moment, frankly, um, we've got the capacity through, because Congress has been very clear about their support for the project, we've got the financial capacity and we're working with our partners to get all the pieces in place so we can make this uh, program um, happen on schedule and start delivering the benefits that we know are essential for the region. Any other questions? I have a question. So first a comment, uh, to get here today from Albany, I, I took Amtrak, thank you. And uh, during my time in DC, I was a weekly commuter using uh, Amtrak, so thank you. Great. Um, um, it, I guess in, in the discussion about the future, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, sort of uh, the infrastructure improvements needed and the funding needs for that. Um, where, if, if you could quickly, any plans for service improvements, high speed, uh, that type of thing. Any, any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, there, the, the region I participated in, uh, in a big planning process, environmental process that 
uh, certainly Amtrak pursued it too, and he, that was led by the Federal Railroad Administration called the NEC Future. Uh, this was a tier one environmental process to look ahead at the quarter and the quarter needs over the next really 20 years, uh, aimed towards 2040. And a um, key part of that was the consideration of high speed and how we continue to expand the service offering we have here in the Northeast. Uh, today we're limited um, by equipment to an infrastructure to uh, about 150 miles an hour. We, we, we have just bought new trains. Uh, you know, the first prototype is out in Pueblo, Colorado on a test track. The second one's gonna show up here in Pennsylvania uh, from Hornell in about four weeks. Uh, those trains are capable of 186 miles an hour. Uh, what's, what the problem we have is our infrastructure and the infrastructure limitations. Um, we will be able to get, I think, a little more speed out of them on the current infrastructure, but fundamentally we, uh, we, what we require is uh, an upgraded infrastructure that has the track um, uh, geometry that's necessary to support high speed and to, to go fast, you really need to go straight. And, um, and also the track capacity so that we can separate the very high speed trains from our slower regional trains, commuter trains, et cetera, that need to have, that have a stopping pattern that you know, is inconsistent with, uh, with a, a lot of uh, very fast trains. So as part of the NEC future, there are a number of opportunities that are in that, that have been permitted basically at the tier one level through, uh, through the record of decision, um, which look at expanding high speed opportunities between basically Wilmington and Baltimore, which would help take off uh, a big chunk of the trip to the south. Uh, also some opportunities looking up uh, as we head north between New York and Boston. Um, our original proposal, just to give you some sense of what's possible in this quarter, you know, just applying sort of everyday technology. And, and just to be clear, right, high speed is a mature technology. We're talking about a technology that's 50 years old, right? So. Um, just applying conventional high-speed technology in the Northeast Corridor with the right alignment, you could have a 220 mile an hour service between New York and Washington. You could connect Philadelphia to New York in 38 minutes. You could have you know, 12 trains an hour. These are all things that are entirely possible with the right level of will and funding, but um, we're not there yet. We are far away from, from there, but we are, as part of this program, looking to have higher speed track, which can give us more options for, um, for service. At the same time, moving some of the high speed trains out of the mix of the conventional railway, which gives us more opportunity for, for commuter. And across the country, you know, there's obviously a number of high speed projects underway. We're, we're supportive of all of them. We think it's great. Uh, you know, we think that high speed is, is absolutely right in a number of key markets in the US. And, you know, again, we're 50 years, frankly, behind, um, availing ourselves of a really uh, incredibly reliable and efficient uh, technology. Um, so we're anxious to see uh, that develop. And in the corridor, we, I think, really are focused on incremental uh, trip time improvements. And I will say that the value of the Northeast in particular is this sort of string of pearls city environment, right? We've got all these metropolitan regions close together within an hour and, um, even taking five or 10 minutes off can materially impact uh, demand and can really make things better for commuters. So our uh, focus is on trying to find ways to reduce uh, at smaller dollar levels the trip time for our current services and help uh, both our commuter railroads and us uh, get a more reliable and faster journey. And uh, over the coming years, I think you'll see opportunities uh, like that realize. Oh, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, thanks again, Stephen. We'll now move on to our next agenda item. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. We'll now move on to the public participation item in the agenda. 15 minutes of the agenda has been set aside to hear from registered speakers. We'll hear from these speakers in the order they have registered to speak for the duration of the allotted time. We ask each registered speaker to limit their comments to no more than three minutes so we can hear from as many speakers as possible in the allotted time. If you have printed versions of your statements, we will take them and share them with the members. 
When I call your name, please use the microphones that are in the front of the stage. I guess they're on the sides of the stage, on the, on the steps. So our first speaker is Murray Bowden. People <clears throat> are dying at an alarming rate in this area, both in, in this area and in Westchester where I live. There's an inconsistency in the road lines and the markings and the signs. Governor Cuomo said, remove the silos, make everything the same everywhere else. Consistency makes for safer roads. The Federal Highway Administration's Manual on Uniform Traffic Control is riddled with errors. The words are the law. The diagrams are not. People have been going and repeating the diagrams for the last 10, 20 years, and they're wrong. What do we do about it? I'm 86 and I'm gonna die soon, and it's out of my hands, it's in your hands. Polly, you know I've said this before, your department is in charge of New York City. There are multiple agencies with multiple rules. Susan Pondash knows how to get it right. Your lawyer, because I've met with her. If you can't get the, rule, the lines and the markings in New York City, and the metropolitan area will follow, correct, because I've let you know over the past years, not year, years, and the lines have not been corrected. It may be time for you to retire and let somebody come in who's more flexible. Transformation at the MTA is leading in how things have to change. If you don't understand transformation means letting new ideas come in and correcting the old ones, then move on and let somebody else do it. Okay, our next speaker is David Gelman. Hi there. Um, this is largely what I presented last September at the previous meeting, and in fact, you can get the gist of it on page five of your current uh, agenda in front of you. But uh, please indulge me for the three minutes to uh, read this off to you. My name is David Gelman, and I'm a member of Community Board 8 on the upper, upper, upper west side of New York City, representing Spidendival and Riverdale. I'm a member of uh, its land use parks and transportation committees, as well as its budget chair, though I come today as its closest resident to the Seneca Highway award-winning Henry Hudson Bridge in the context of Vision Zero Safety and Governor Andrew Cuomo's Empire Trail. I think that you would be particularly interested in this because for generations, the bridge shared its spans from Manhattan to the Bronx for automobiles and pedestrians on both the lower and upper levels, providing spectacular views of both the Spitendival and the Hudson to the west and as well as Inwood Hill Park and Columbia's Baker Field to the south and east. About a decade ago at MTA's last major $80 million bridge renovation, they closed off the pedestrian path on the upper level, a significant community amenity, ostensibly to prevent us from walking through the employee parking lot in the post 9-11 world. Well now, with easy pass cashless tolling, there are no employees nor their vehicles in the lot anymore. I come to you requesting that state and city DOT use your public transportation and mobility roles to prevail upon MTA bridges to reopen the pedestrian path on the upper level of the bridge now and permanently. I've discussed this matter with their engineers who advised, logically, anything can be done. It's just a matter of time, money, and MTA priorities. I acknowledge that reopening this upper path, path will cost tens of thousands of dollars for a few dozen Jersey barriers, which I know MTA has hundreds of them sitting idle underneath the RFK Triborough Bridge. The current rehabilitation project is budgeted for $87 million, and MTA's own projections are for 22 million cars, providing $92 million in revenues annually. The vast majority of these cars are not from Riverdale and the Bronx, but we suffer all the traffic, noise, pollution, heat, et cetera, 
that they produce. Frankly, on a cost versus community benefit basis alone, this is a no-brainer. Reopening this path would cost less than one-half of one-tenth of one percent of either the capital uh, project budget or the annual toll revenue from the polluting traffic. Reopening the upper path will provide the quality of life for suffering Riverdale residents, reopening a significant recreational and pedestrian park access. Vastly expand bicycling options for Riverdale residents for the safe 20 plus miles of paths around Manhattan, as well as direct access to cycling options of the GW Bridge and into New Jersey. And ex then expand healthy, non-polluting commuting options. But wait, there's more. It will create a safe off-street link to Manhattan for Governor Andrew Cuomo's Empire Trail, as opposed to the unsafe option of uh, biking across the spiky uh, Broadway Bridge. New Yorkers are often confronted with bureaucracies that respond with, essentially, we don't gotta, we ain't gonna. I won't take more of your time to go through the details, but I'd be glad to do so with your designated representative, as long as you give them the charge of, it sounds doable, figure it out. Uh, to paraphrase the MT Bridges, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, I dream things that should be and say, why not? In fact, um, uh, frankly, this ain't rocket science. In the words of uh, Daniel Whitney, uh, better known as Larry the Cable Guy of the um, Blue Collar Comedy Tour, get her done. Um, our, our state and local uh, elected officials are interested in this. And of course, my estimates may be low, but even if I'm underestimating the cost by 100%, reopening this valuable amenity will once again serve the communities that suffer the most of the downsides of the Henry Hudson Bridge and Parkway for generations to come and should be done on the quality of life uh, merits alone. For Pete's sake, get her done. Thank you. Uh, George Hyakalis. That's close. Uh, George Hyakalis. Uh, I'm the president of the uh, Institute for Rational Urban Mobility. IRAM is a New York City based nonprofit concerned with reducing motor vehicular congestion and improving the uh, livability of dense urban places. I'm also an alumnus of the old tri state regional planning. Commission and therefore quite old, <laughs> if that's uh, a commendation. commendation. Uh, Iram continues to urge NIMTIC to take a leadership role in advocating for sensible, cost effective plans, uh, which is a, a clue to get a, a funding of, for the future. If you, if you can make the plans more cost effective, you can get more things done. Uh, and in any event, uh, a, a key element of this should be to remake the commuter, three commuter rail agencies and, and Amtrak into a comprehensive regional rail system with frequent service, integrated fares, and through running, first at Penn Station and then between Penn Station and Grand Central. Even after more than three decades of public ownership, and after the expenditure of countless billions of taxpayer dollars, there is no through operation of regional rail trains at Penn Station. This is a national embarrassment. Many studies indicate that through running could increase peak hour train capacity by 25% or more. This is not only Amtrak's problem, less than 5% of morning peak hour inbound passengers are on Amtrak trains. The bulk of these passengers are west of Hudson residents traveling to high paying jobs in the Manhattan Central Business District on New Jersey transit trains. Maintaining a good access to the Manhattan CBD for the region's labor force is a shared metropolitan problem. The attached pages uh, uh, and this handout, I hope you've gotten, the, I don't know, if, has everyone got a copy of the handout up on the table there? Uh, 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 we're distributed to, Tuesday evening at uh, uh, an architecture forum at, on Sunnyside Yard, the future of Sunnyside Yard, and they describe opportunities suggested by IAM for more efficient use of Amtrak facilities in New York City, and I would urge the council members to take a careful look at these, and if there are questions, to contact uh, IAM. This council should stand up for the voters who elected its members and replace the inward looking railroad bureaucracies responsible for the current failed plan. 
Working closer with its other planning partners throughout the region, NIMTIC should be advancing a cost-effective, state-of-the-art transit system that would be the envy of other global business centers. The council should make the case for sensible operating strategies and inf infrastructure investments. Thank you. Uh, Michael Klatsky. Good morning. Good morning, esteemed members of the council, um, support staff, and transportation professionals from throughout the region. Throughout the region, um, the reason I'm here today is I'm here. My name is Michael Klatsky. I'm the director of planning for the town of Rampo on behalf of Supervisor Michael Specht. I'm here today to um, infor inform this council about the urgency for continued transportation investment in Rockland County. In the in the UPWP for the past several years. Uh, Rockland County has had one, two, or three projects, uh, minor projects essentially that pass through the region uh, for the entire Mid-Hudson region. Uh, our county has, uh, based on a report from the New York City Department of City Planning, has more, had more building permit activity than Nassau County. It is, only, it is only fair that a fair share of transportation discretionary funding is allocated to Rockland County in that manner uh, as a fair distribution for rapid growth. What's happening now is that, I mean, there is continued transportation investment. Uh, this council last year uh, voted to allocate funding for a transportation and land use study in Rockland County. That is a tremendous first step that our citizens are extremely grateful for. Um, when that study issues some recommendations to this council later this year, our request to you is that this board quickly acts upon those recommendations and provides funding recommendations for federal funding, additional discretionary funding for additional planning studies in Rockland County as well. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to our action items. Uh, we will begin today's business of action items on the agenda. The, the first action is to accept the September 5th, 2019 meeting synopsis. I'm requesting all members to announce your name and the agency you represent when you make a motion or second a motion. Are there any comments on the synopsis? Hearing none, I'll proceed. Motion to accept the September 5th, 2019 meeting synopsis. Naomi Klein, Westchester County, so moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Uh, All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. The next action item is to adopt resolution number 2020-1, Council Adoption of the State Fiscal Year 2020-2021 Unified Planning Work Program. I'll ask Setu Allen of NIMTIC of the NIMTIC staff to introduce the resolution. Hi, good afternoon. So a NIMTIC's Unified Planning Work Program, otherwise known as the UPWP, serves as the MPO's budget. It is built collectively by NIMTIC staff and its member agencies, and the state fiscal year 2020-21 Unified Planning Work Program is a $48 million program, which is roughly one half old funding, one half new funding, and 60% of it will go to fund NIMTIC staff activities, as well as 40%, roughly 40%, that will go to fund acti planning activities at the member agencies. The NIMTIC UPWP defines the planning priorities for the regions. It ensures that it has planning activities that ensure our compliance with the federally mandated transportation planning process. It enables the region to implement the goals and goals in the long range plan, plan 2045, as well as de develop recommendations to improve the transportation system. The main focus for the 2020-2021 program year will be development of NIMTIC's next plan, Plan 2050. That plan will define the region's vision as well as the goals through the federal fiscal year 2050 and also guide trans transportation investments throughout the region. In addition to that activities, there'll be lots of work related to data collection, survey work, uh, doing various forecasts such as socio socioeconomic and demographic forecast, forecast of the transportation system, congestion forecast, as well as emissions analyses. 
In addition, as a part of all of that work, there will also be substantial and extensive public outreach in support of the plan, as well as other activities funded through NIMTIC. In addition to that work, NIMTIC funds various, excuse me, sub-regional, area-wide, and corridor studies. Many of these studies are funded by individual member agencies and enable, and they have various topics such as asset management, mobility studies, uh, analyzing emerging trends in the transportation field, and networks, transit network studies. These studies are consistent with the plan. They will help the region achieve its goals, and most of them are managed and sponsored individually or collectively through uh, NIMTIC member agencies. This was just a really brief overview of the NIMTIC planning program. As mentioned, it's a $48 million program, of which 60% goes to NIMTIC staff, and the remaining is passed through to the member agencies. Uh, much thanks goes to the member agencies and NIMTIC staff for developing this program. And at this time, I'd like to request that the council adopt the State Fiscal Year 2020-2021 Unified Planning Work Program. Thank you, Saitu. Any questions from the board? Okay, I will proceed with the vote. Motion to accept resolution number 2020-1, council adoption of the state fiscal year 2020-2021 unified planning work program. Uh, thank you, a second. Larry, then an MTA, second. Thanks. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes. The next action item is to adopt resolution 2020-2, recognition of service as NIMTIC co-chair by Polly Trottenberg, New York City Department of Transportation Commissioner. Whereas Polly Trottenberg is New York City's Transportation Commissioner and a principal member of the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, the Council, and whereas Commissioner Trottenberg served as the Council's co-chair from March 6, 2019 through February 27, 2020, and whereas during her service as co-chair, Commissioner Trottenberg served with dedication and provided valuable leadership and vision to the Council, and whereas Commissioner Trottenberg will continue to participate as a principal member of the Council. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council expresses its appreciation to Commissioner Polly Trottenberg for her service and leadership over the past year as the Council's co-chair. Now I'd like to ask for a motion to accept resolution 2020-2 2020-2 recognition of service as NIMTIC co-chair by Polly Trottenberg. Do I hear a, a motion? I'll make a motion. <laughs> a second? Larry, I guess I should second, second it. <laughs> all, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Commissioner Trottenberg, would you like to say a few words? Well, I, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to the NIMTIC staff who do a lot of great work, I think sometimes under challenging and, and maybe a little thankless circumstances, they really do a great job. And then thanks to all our members here. It is a nice chance. We are a big complicated region and certainly NIMTIC provides us all with a nice opportunity to get together from time to time and talk through, you know, what the transportation needs of the region are. So, so thanks very much, Greg. I'll hand it back to you. Our final action is to confirm the new rotating co-chair, Rockland County Executive Ed Day. Per the memo of understanding for the council, the co-chair is rotated annually among the three transportation coordinating committees or TCC, Mid-Hudson South, Nassau, Suffolk, and New York City. Last year, the co-chair was selected from the New York City TCC. This year, the co-chair has been selected from the Mid-Hudson South TCC. Rockland County Executive Ed Day has been voted to be the co-chair for the new program year. Mr. Day, would you like to say a few words? 
Thank you very much. Um, um, first of all, I'm honored to, uh, to be able to do this. Um, I look to dedicate my efforts uh, to um, improving the, ser the service in the region, working with my uh, fellow board members, uh, looking at the Gateway Project in particular, which will afford Rockland County a one-seat ride at some point to Manhattan, and uh, also looking at the safety aspect of what we do. Um, just as an aside, I'd like to point out a couple of things. Uh, Mr. Klatsky, uh, the resolution we voted on 2020 number one uh, does include study work for Rockland County. Uh, I'm very proud to have um, moved that. And um, Mr. Gelman of uh, Community Board 8, I find it remarkable that at a time where we have just put together one of the biggest bridges in the, in the, in the country, the Tappan Sea Bridge, it was, very, it was a very strong focus on having um, a walkway for bikes and pedestrians. Um, I have a familiarity with your community. I was, my first six years as an NYPD officer was in Washington Heights. So um, it, what you offer sounds very desirable. And certainly I would hope that, uh, I know our council here will consider it and hope be able to complete that, uh, that request. But that, thank you very much for having me on board. Uh, with that, I'll ask the council for a motion to adjourn. Yes. <laughs> I make a motion so we, I have a long commute. <laughs> uh, do I hear a second? Second. Any, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. The council is adjourned.